Thanks, Ali. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I hope you've enjoyed Data and AI Summit thus far. This conference started as a Spark Summit, and these roots are very important to me personally and the Apache Spark community, even though we've expanded to cover a lot of other topics um, and technologies. I want to talk to you today about the growth of Spark, its shift in uh, usage, and in particular, making Apache Spark better for data scientists. Today, we're seeing more and more Sparks used as the engine to power the lake house architecture. And this is about combining the very different types of workloads and use cases, from ETL to BI to data science to uh, machine learning. But this was not always the case. In 2013, um, virtually everybody was using Spark Scala API. Um, over the years, we've done a lot of work to make Spark more accessible to data teams, including improving the SQL and the Python API. Last week, we look at the number of commands run on Databricks platform, and it's astonishing when comparing with 2013. While Scala is for sure still a first-class API and powers many and many of the most important compute-intensive data engineering jobs, you see the rapid rise of Python and SQL, each claiming almost half of all of the commands. And this is really the evidence for the Lake House vision because data scientists are using Python while a lot of analysts are using SQL. The development of the Spark project also reflects this trend. We're investing heavily in SQL, in particular when it comes to NC SQL compliance. Um, and Python, I don't have a lot of time to go into details about all of the changes, and we have to spend sort of hours and hours here. Uh, but instead, today, I want to focus on data science and Python. So most data science workloads are done on laptops today, um, and the dominant programming language is Python. Due to resource constraints on these laptops, and sometimes just be, uh, beefier servers even, um, the way the libraries are designed, um, they can usually only handle hundreds of megabytes of data, and occasionally going up to gigabytes. So data scientists often work with a downsampled data set instead of the entire data set. Now, of course, some data scientists also use Spark to process terabytes or even petabytes of data. However, Spark's a very, very different too from what most data scientists know. And the gap between laptop data science and distributed computation can be very large. Two years ago, we came up with this idea of how do we marry the both worlds? The single node Python data science world with distributed computation on big data. We want to really make it easy for data scientists accustomed to programming on a single node, like a laptop, to work in a distributed Spark environment. And as all of you are probably aware, the most important library, the single most important library for data science is Pandas. If you pick a Data Science 101 class, um, chances are it would teach you Pandas. So we came up with the idea to scale Pandas API using Spark and created the experimental library called Koalas. Koalas were announced about two years ago. Um, it enables data scientists to easily port their Pandas code base over with one line of import change their uh, pandas code can now execute at scale. There's no need to learn a new API. You can even just search on Stack Overflow and find snippets of code other have shared and use those to, um, to cover a much larger amount of data. In the past two years, uh, we've been really humbled by the reception um, and adoption of Koalas. Every day now, we see three million downloads of Koalas on PyPy, the Python package index. And many of our customers have told us Koalas fundamentally changed the way they work. Just like data engineers used to tell us about Spark that changed the way they conduct data pipelines, data scientists tell us now Koalas have changed the way they do data science at scale. Today, we're super excited to announce that Databricks donating the Koalas project into upstream Apache Spark. We'll work with the rest of the community to merge Koalas in. Now, anytime you write code for Spark, you know that the Pandas API is available at your disposal. There are two big advantages of running your Pandas code using Spark, scalability and performance. Even on a single node, for larger amount of data, like one shown on the screen that was 31 gigabyte, Pandas on Spark can perform better than Pandas itself due to the multi-threading execution. Because Pandas runs everything in a single thread. Sometimes Pandas perform better because it's a lower overhead. Um, but once you get to larger amount of data, Pandas wouldn't be able to handle it. Um, often you get an out-of-memory error, or if it could, it might be slow due to the single-threaded nature. Pandas on Spark, on the other hand, can leverage Spark's own computation engine to handle large data sets. Even on a single node, it can gracefully handle data much larger than memory using external operations. 
And of course, if you add more compute resources to it, it can scale linearly to reduce runtime, all using the same Pandas API. One other thing that's really cool about merging uh, Koalas into a Spark is that Spark users now, even without using the Pandas API, can get visualization capabilities out of the box. With just a few lines of code, they can plot beautiful charts for their data big and small. And the best part is users don't even need to downsample their data. The Pandas API on Spark has implemented efficient plotting techniques based on the types of plot you're using. If you're plotting a histogram, KDE or box plot, you compute the data to plot using PySpark API under the hood, such as bucketizer, kernel density, and approximate percentile. You then pass the result to a plotting library, such as Plotly, to draw the plots. You can finally plot your entire data set without needing to downsample it first and reason out a memory error. Now, plot such a pie ch uh, chart, bar chart, um, or bar edge and scatter plots implemented by taking the top end records. The Pandas API on Spark selects the top end by limit and head and passes the result to the plotting library. If you're plotting an area chart or a line chart, it runs a uniform sample across all of the data and draws the plot using the plotting library. So now Spark, uh, once Koala's merged into Spark, Spark will expose many different APIs for different use cases or personas. And what's really cool is all of them leverage the same underlying engine. We go through the same optimization uh, pipelines. So you get more or less the same performance, regardless of which one you want to use. We hope, we hope you all find the adoption of the Pandas API to Spark makes your move to big data, Python data science simple. In the second half of the talk, I want to talk to you about the general area of work to make Spark more Pythonic as part of the Project Zen. Project Zen's named after a set of 20 guiding principles in the Zen of Python by Tim Peters introduced in 2004. Clarity is very important for a great developer experience. So here are the four principles which guide us to increase uh, clarity. First is error should never pass silently. Readability counts. Explicit is better than implicit. And simple is better than complex. You have used PySpark. You probably know this PySpark's error messages are not the easiest to read. Um, as, uh, as a matter of fact, there's a tweet by Randy here. Um, in 2015, they pointed out, hey, 30 characters of code can you 97 lines of error messages. And we have heard you, Randy. Back when some of those tweets were written, we had pages upon pages of error messages intermixing typically Python stack traces and Java stack traces. Um, we started improving error messages in Spark 3.1, making the origin of the Python error much more clear. And in the Data and AI Summit um, in 2020, we talked about actually cutting down six pages of error messages down to just one in Spark 3.1. But we didn't stop there. Now we have actually made those error messages even shorter by another 50%. And this changes in development will be available in the next release of Spark. Now, being concise isn't the only goal. Another important uh, part of error messages design is to make it easy for users to find the underlying courses. Um, the typical workflow for most data scientists or engineers is to search on the web or stack overflow to find what's uh, going on with the program. And to make that specific workflow easy, um, we're introducing error codes to error messages. This will make it much easier to locate and capture the root cause of errors. And this should change will also be available in the next release of Spark. While runtime errors are helpful, um, it would be even better if we can catch error and mistakes at the time of writing code. So we've introduced type hints throughout Spark's code base that will result in much better error messages in both IDEs and notebooks using static analysis, as shown on the screen here. Um, in addition, type hints also act as an explicit contract for large code bases. And this change will be available as part of Spark 3.1. Now, let's move on to uh, autocomplete. I personally rely on autocomplete in IDEs and notebooks every day because I, don't, I can't memorize all the different APIs. Before Project Zen, autocomplete for PySpark leaves a lot to be desired. It lacks context and can't show the most important things. In the screen here, um, I most likely wanted to look at the various different types of CSV parsing options, but the suggestions are not at all useful. Now with Project Zen, we're shipping a much better autocomplete that's context aware and relevant and it works both in IDs as well as notebooks. All of this great Python code you're writing often require dependent libraries to be installed or configured. And this is uniquely challenging in a distributed environment where some of the uh, nodes that can have library available while some of the others don't. 
Um, we have now actually improved our integration with Conda, Virtual Env, and Pax to ship and manage Python dependencies. So you can manage all of these dependencies of your program on a cluster using the same set of tools on a single node. Now I'm going to pass it over to Brooke Wenig, a data scientist at Databricks who uses Pandas every day. She's going to show us a demo of some of these new changes working together. Thanks, Reynolds. This past year, Hawaii has become an even more popular vacation destination. And for this demo, I thought it'd be fun to analyze some Airbnb listings for Hawaii so that we can plan our vacation too. Plus, who doesn't love pandas on a surfboard? I started my foray into data science with pandas. I loved the ease of the API, the documentation, the developer community, everything about it I love. As you can see, I've already written some pandas code here. I'm going to load in a data set, filter out some records that the price is either free or above $10,000, because yes, those show up in the data set, and then select just a subset of the columns. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at our data. We can see here the number of bedrooms, the listing, the name, et cetera. But now I want a solution that scales, maybe not just for Hawaii, but for all Airbnbs across the globe. To do that, all I need to change is just one import. Instead of importing pandas, I'll import pyspark.pandas, and I'll change the alias as well. So now we have a solution that scales without requiring any code change apart from an import. And as you can see here, we get the same results. So by merging this Pandas API on Spark into the core Apache Spark project, Spark finally has a solution for plotting data at scale. I no longer need to downsample my data or collect it back to the driver. Based off of the type of plot that I'm using, the Pandas API on Spark will figure out the optimal way to execute it. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the average price based off of the number of bedrooms. You can see here that the default backend is Plotly, a visualization tool many of you already know and love. And we can see that as the number of bedrooms increases, the price also generally increases. But there is a steal of an Airbnb with 11 bedrooms for $900. But you're not locked into just using the Panda syntax. We can always call to Spark on our data frame and get the underlying PySpark data frame. This effectively drops all of the metadata and so you can see there's no performance hit to going back to our underlying PySpark data frame. So now we can always use the PySpark API to ask questions such as, what is the most popular property type that, that is available for rent? And we can see the top three are condos, houses, and apartments. If we were to do that using the Panda syntax, you'll actually see it's quite different. The end result is the same, but the syntax is quite different. And this is what the Pandas API on Spark seeks to unify one API that scales as your data scales, so you don't need to spend time converting it over into another syntax or accidentally introduce errors in the process. And lastly, the moment you've all been waiting for, which Airbnb should we rent? While I could write this code in Python to answer that question, I actually find it a little bit more intuitive to write it in SQL. Here you'll notice I'm using ps.sql, quite similar to spark.sql, but it has an added benefit Whenever I work with the Pandas API on Spark data frame, it's automatically registered inside of the SQL context. What that means is that I no longer have to create a view or a table to be able to then query it in SQL. I can just natively access it by passing it inside of these curly braces. So I'm gonna go ahead and select all of the columns, but I'm gonna filter for just looking into the neighborhood of Lanai. I'd like the host to be a super host, the price to be less than $400, and it must be sparkling clean. So it looks like we're recommended to stay at the artist house. I don't know about you, but I'm interested in taking a look at some photos of this. Let's go ahead and pull up the listing URL. So here we can see the artist house accommodates six guests, two bedrooms. Overall seems like a great place to stay. Mahalo, thank you everyone. And now I'd like to pass it back to Reynold. But before I do that, I think you need your very own surfing panda, Reynold. Surf's up. Thank you, Brooke, for the demo, and of course, the surfing panda from Hawaii. Just to wrap up, the core focus of Spark Project today is to enable the lake house architecture, 
creating a single platform for data engineering, SQL, BI, data science, and machine learning. In this talk, we talk about, um, we focus on two parts. The first is the merging of the Koalas project into Spark. So data scientists can now, you know, using a single Pandas API to form analysis on both data small and large on the laptop and large data on the cluster. In addition, we have done a lot of work on the usability to make Spark a lot more Pythonic with dramatically shorter and more clear error messages, contextual autocomplete, and type hints. This changes really marry data, a single node data science and big data, making Spark an even better tool for data scientists. But in reality, there are a lot of exciting changes everywhere that we didn't have time to get into today. Please keep an eye out for them in this conference or other talks in the future and the blog posts and release notes.